Marco is head, global head of uh, Janssen Solutions and Janssen Healthcare Innovation. Um, he's a passionate uh, person about new value streams being delivered by cross-industry collaborations, uh, open innovation and integrated care models. Uh, he's quoted as saying, we are calling for pharmaceutical companies to move beyond selling therapies into playing a broader and more proactive role in the healthcare industry, in the healthcare delivery rather. So um, I think he's aiming high and broad. Um, John Paul Sherlock um, on the panel um, comes to us today from AstraZeneca. He's Director of Intelligent Pharmaceuticals Respiratory Specialty. He's um, fortunately somebody who knows what he's talking about. He's a chemical engineer by background and has crossed the Rubicon to be an acknowledged expert on innovative pharmaceutical process engineering. So we can pay attention. Um, Louise Wrighton is Global Marketing Operations Manager at 3M Drug Delivery Systems. She's a seasoned marketeer with long experience with global over-the-counter over uh, healthcare and is steering 3M's global inhaled and transdermal drug delivery technologies businesses. I've got um, Yuri Rosenman, um, who is Director of Business Development at Qualcomm Life. Um, and they manage and enable medical device and medical data um, connectivity for healthcare companies, so uh, very useful folks. Um, Yuri used to be head of healthcare and life sciences industry at BT Global Services, uh, and he's now very sensibly um, gone off to San Diego to uh, put down some roots. I'm very envious. <laughs> And lastly, Mark Duman, who um, asked a question at the end of the last um, panel and was chairing the panel um, in the other track earlier about patient centricity, uh, we've managed to persuade him to join us. Um, he's a director of uh, market development of Intellicent and he's a non-executive director of the Patient Information Forum. And that's a UK membership organisation for the providers of patient information and patient support. So. Super. Um, I will start with Marco, mm -hmm. to, uh, and I'm going to invite the panel just to give a little opening perspective on yeah. patient adherence. Right. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, over the last five years, I, I had, a, I think, the privilege to um, uh, set up and, and, and then grow um, a team, a small team that, uh, within Janssen that was looking at addressing a fundamental question that uh, we had at that time, which was, to your point earlier, is there a role for pharmaceuticals, uh, for pharmaceutical companies in uh, improving healthcare, or do we just focus on our core business and uh, and do as and that as efficiently as and effectively as possible? I am. I do believe that we can play a broader role in healthcare. I think we should be partnering with uh, healthcare systems and hospitals. Um, we should be a lot more patient-centric as an organisation, and as part of that. It's a vision. Um, we set up um, a number of different projects and pilots, and uh, we experimented with new business models. Um, so we, we've uh, gathered a lot of insight and learnings through this process, uh, which I'm happy to share with you. Uh, some of them, uh, and then we zoom in on the topic of adherence, which is something that I'm particularly passionate about because it's a huge, huge issue uh, that is uh, still unaddressed. Um, so it is a little bit of a holy grail. In um, you know, uh, if we solve that, it's a clear win-win for everyone, for uh, for the patient in first place, but for the healthcare systems, they save cost and you know there's no waste, and obviously for the pharmaceutical companies as well. Um, but we haven't solved it uh, solved it yet, and I don't know if it's 25 percent or 50 percent the actual number. But regardless of that, I mean you you should be thinking about about that as you know, a, a big, big problem. Uh, imagine if we were, uh, all our patients were 100% compliant, uh, that would mean on one hand, you know, much better outcomes, but on the other hand also, you know, twice the budget <laughs> uh, of, on pharmaceuticals being spent. So, um, so the question I, and, and the insights I have here are related to, um, or, or, or the questions I ask myself is how can we, what is the problem? Is it, this is a hugely complicated problem. There's many reasons why patients are not adherent, intentional and non-intentional. Um, it's difficult to measure. And also I think it is um, very, very, it's related to behavioral change. So driving behavioral change is extremely hard and sustaining that behavioral change is even harder over time. Um, but then there are questions also that we, uh, that we should be asking ourselves about should we be playing, should we be investing in improving adherence as a pharmaceutical company? Um, and I believe we should, but the question is, do patients want us to be involved in that? Do healthcare systems and H uh, HCPs want us to be involved in it? Do we have the right to play in that space? Okay. That's an important question that I think we need to answer. Um, and then, are we able 
to do that? Do we have the capabilities as a company to execute on these, uh, on these programs, uh, which are holistic and multidimensional? So it's, by, uh, it's, it's a very hard, it's easy, it's a, it's a great topic, it's very easy to point you know, the finger on what the issue is, but then you start you know, peeling the onion and it's a lot more complicated than uh, in terms of you know, what, addressing the underlying causes of non-adherence and then executing on it. Uh, and the question again is rights to play for the pharmaceutical industry. So yes. I'll throw it out there to the audience and also to the panelists because uh, I'm sure we will be hopefully disagreeing a little bit uh, as opposed to agreeing on it. I think that's a good question, but I also think that we're assuming that's a question we're going to have to answer if outcomes data you know, circle back to us, then clearly we've got to be able to make If that. people open up outcomes data yeah. and are transparent yeah. about it, which yeah. I believe has to happen, yes, uh, part of the issue is, you know, access to data and transparency on outcomes and performance. Uh, but anyway. Yes, um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. That's great. <laughs> John. Thanks, Tina. So, uh, yes, uh, John Paul Sherlock, I um, work in uh, our intelligent pharmaceuticals part of the organisation, so that's what the name AstraZeneca give to our digital health group. Uh, and I lead our respiratory portfolio. And in respiratory, I think, you know, clearly we're talking about a number of therapy areas, but respiratory, you know, this is uh, a very active area. Um, and it's, it's driven um, for, for a number of reasons, um, but, but primarily because of the, the, there is an unmet, unmet need, a significant unmet need. So I mean, just to pull some numbers out of the uh, recent Asthma UK report in Connected Health, uh, we've got 5.4 million people in the UK with asthma. Um, we spend about a billion pounds in direct health care. Um, it's uh, yeah, about 52 million of that is in GM, uh, GP consultancy. And yet, you know, three people die every day in the UK as a consequence of asthma. And so you kind of look at that and you think, well, adherence can't possibly be a problem. But actually, you know, 30 to 70 percent of asthma patients do not take their medication. And, you know, that, that kind of just almost doesn't make sense when you think actually you know, these, these are medicines broadly recognised as, as, as saving lives uh, and, and preventing exacerbations, asthma attacks, you know, various things, and yet you know, patients don't take. So it's, it's an interesting conundrum, and I think there are explanations for it, but uh, and, and, and until we start out the conversation, this isn't a patient's problem. It's, it's a problem that, you know, if you look at NICE guidelines, it's the healthcare providers and the industry that basically have to provide a solution that patients want to take or, or want to partake in. So you know, I think that's why, for me, the industry has got a right to play in this space. They understand disease, they understand how to develop medical devices, they actually provide something um, that the patient isn't in the patient's hands. And if we do that in a good way, then we can start to address some of the factors associated with um, adherence. And, and as we've kind of alluded to, you know, we've, we recognise the factors around adherence that are pa practical barriers, again, in the respiratory space, maybe it's around correct inhaler use, uh, maybe it's just predominantly about um, you know, not understanding how to use, use that inhaler correctly or just forgetting um, because you know, they're part of a chronic disease where um, you know, day by day symptom, symptomology changes. Um, but then there are a number of percepts, you know, effectively beliefs that it's a so barriers to, to perception. And if, you know, generally, you know, people do not want to take medicines because that reminds them they're unwell. Okay, so there's a, a barrier there that says, actually, I, don't, I want to kind of move to a point where I'm not taking my medication. And that kind of belief and that belief structure around a medication use is, is clearly a barrier and a, a blocker and something that we, we want to unlock. So I think predominantly the adherence piece is, is behavioral and it's uh, these practical barriers and we need to address those. And we've tried a lot. So, you know, multiple adherence programs, most, I think, marketeers probably can talk a lot about, about all their adherence programs. Uh, I think it's the Cochrane report that said 56% of those, only 56% of those is successful. So effectively flip a coin and uh, decide. And um, we need to, we're, we're effectively working in that environment to say, actually, we're offering you something new and different. We, are, we believe we have something now as a, as a consequence of the technologies that are emerging that is going to help us change and move away from you know, failed adherence um, proposals and propositions and systems and, and, and services to something that is going to support and enable patients to self-manage more effectively. And that's kind of where we're coming from. So that's what I'm involved in. I'm involved in developing the technology side of things with connected, uh, connected inhalers, uh, connected devices, 
but probably more interesting, how do you create systems and services that ultimately enable patients to self-manage? And the end game for us takes us into a data uh, area where we're very much looking at enabling um, sort of a, a detection of exacerbations early and actually being able to intervene before exacerbations hospitalisation. But that's for us. Unless you get patients using their medications properly and wanting to be part of managing their condition, then you can't get to that other stuff. It doesn't help when Bradley Wiggins gets lambasted all over the press for using his plasma medication, does it really? No. no. <laughs> uh, okay. Louise um, from 3 years. Thank you, Tina. So I did lots of nodding through uh, JP's uh, intro there because I work in the respiratory space as well. So I'm with 3M Drug Delivery Systems. We are a CDMO. We develop, manufacture oh. and supply predominantly asthma inhalers, uh, but also um, transdermal skin patches to the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, what we're trying to do is keep pace with, obviously, what these issues are, and then work in partnership you know, with pharmaceutical companies to help to solve them. And we do that because we're 3M through trying to apply technologies. Um, so we're, we're interested in, in adherence, I use the word adherence, and we're interested in that from two perspectives, and, and John Paul really touched on them, but, but you know, we're really clear that there are two factors around ad adherence, especially in the space that we're working in. And the first is about product design, you know, how do you make products more patient friendly? so that people want to adhere to them. And I don't think we should underestimate this as an issue. You know, you could take an elderly person on memantine, take away their pills, give them a seven day patch that goes between the shoulder blades, they forget they're wearing it, and then adherence isn't an issue. You know, that's in the hands of a caregiver. Um, we can apply our, our own microneedles technology to an injectable. Suddenly, that's not painful. You haven't got someone putting off using that today because they don't quite feel up to it, you know, and, and, and the, the, the pain barrier is too high. So I think, um, you know, that, that whole sort of patient centricity and product design you know, from that perspective, shouldn't be overlooked. And of course, like everybody, we are working in connected health. Um, we are developing um, digital health solutions. Um, earlier this year, we launched our intelligent control inhaler, which is a next generation um, smart inhaler designed to not only deliver drug more effectively and efficiently and accurately than ever before, but also collect data on dosing and usage as it's been used um, so that uh, a patient could then be tracked, you know, in, in terms of their usage by by a caregiver, but, you know, by a payer, by whoever wants to track that data. And they could, and themselves, of course, and they can be given, you know, behavioural interventions, be that education, be that um, communities, you know, so, social um, interactions with others with the same issue, et cetera, et cetera. So in summary, my interest is how do we use technology to drive adherence, uh, but not just the new digital smart uh, technologies, I'm really interested in those, but how do we just get some of the basics right as well around using drug delivery technologies, you know, to improve product design? Thanks, Louise, very much. Now, Yuri has a more digital, digital um, perspective than the rest of us, I, I suspect, but so I'm most interested to hear what you're going to say. Thank you, Tina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to participate, and uh, so far it has been absolutely fantastic couple of days. Uh, um, Qualcomm Life has been around for about five years. Uh, it's a fully owned subsidiary of Qualcomm, um, uh, we are focused on mobilizing healthcare uh, and really building the ecosystem, uh, not just uh, focusing on pharmaceutical industry, but certainly working with payers uh, and uh, providers and uh, uh, driving uh, investment into, the, into this uh, uh, ecosystem. We know we can't do everything ourselves. Uh, we set up a couple of funds uh, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, primarily to drive and accelerate the pace of innovation. One fund is a Qualcomm Life Fund, which is uh, run by Qualcomm. It's a 100 million evergreen fund. And uh, one of the companies that we have made investment, which made successful exit, is uh, Fitbit. And uh, there are over 30 companies in which uh, we, have, we have invested so far uh, to accelerate this process. 
Recently, we started another fund, and this time it is primarily focused on pharmaceutical industry, and that is with Novartis. It's called DRX uh, Capital Fund. $50 million was invested by Novartis, and $50 million was put in by uh, Qualcomm. And uh, there are a number of companies which uh, we have already invested to drive uh, both uh, clinical development as well as commercial uh, aspects of uh, uh, of this investment. Uh, one of the companies is Science 37, which is focused on uh, uh, driving innovation into digital development around clinical trials. And they just uh, received a Series C funding of uh, close to $20 million. So uh, the other one, of course, is the X Prize. And this is the area which uh, we are funding one of the prizes, which is focused on devices and diagnostics, developing a device uh, which can detect a number of different uh, digital biomarkers at the same time in a very, very short uh, uh, period of time. So in terms of the projects, and uh, it's been a very exciting space. Uh, uh, I've been with Qualcomm now for about 18 months, and I would say that uh, I would split pharmaceutical companies sort of into, uh, if we were to take top 25 pharmaceutical companies, um, a third of them are actually doing uh, both. They're involved in clinical development, they're beginning to do connected clinical trials where they're utilizing sensors uh, to obtain real-world uh, information uh, directly from patients. Uh, some of it is fairly simple, you know, activity trackers. <coughs> we were also beginning to see uh, continuous glucose monitoring taking place, uh, as well as some of the more um, uh, really um, sort of innovative devices around MS and oncology patches, they can uh, pick up more than uh, one single uh, digital biomarker, such as potentially uh, fever, uh, activity, which could be correlated to fatigue. Uh, and the uh, same companies are also doing work around uh, uh, connected devices, where they're beginning to enable connectivity, and not just to get a date and time stamp of when the inhalation took place or when the injection took place, but also learn about usage, whether the patient is using the inhaler correctly, um, what was the position of the inhaler when the inhalation took place, where the lips were, were they placed on the inhaler, and so on. I would say also a third of the companies are beginning to do more work around clinical development, but not yet in the space of connecting drug delivery devices. And that's an interesting space. They may be moving a little bit slower, but at the same time, they have real programs and real active involvement in this space. And then I would say a third of the companies, they have set up digital accelerators, digital incubators, but at the same time, there are a lot of discussions, but they may not be really doing anything in this space. So it's, a, it's an interesting world. Uh, uh, we'll, of course, get into more specifics in terms of what has been done over the last few years, what has worked, what has not worked so well, and how is it affecting patient compliance. Uh, but overall, I, I would say the level of interest is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and uh, we do anticipate uh, some of the larger trials to take place. So we're seeing some phase 2B and phase 3 trials uh, being set up for early 2017 which will involve anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 patients uh, being involved in the trial. So I'll stop there um, and uh, turn it over to Mark. Thank you. Mark, I'm going to make sure that you answer one question for me, because when we invited you onto the panel, you, you immediately jumped down my throat on email um, and said, what's the difference between compliance and adherence <laughs> as far as from your perspective? So I need to have you answer that question. Okay. Well, I'm not going to yet, but because I'm going to also express my phenomenal interest in Yuri's funds, given I'm looking for work in December and for 2017, so if I can apply personally, <laughs> let me know. Um, I also think it's quite funny hearing JP and Louise speak about having intelligent parts of their organisation, which seems to suggest there's <laughs> non-intelligent parts of the other, so at least, at least we're in. I don't know how you get away with that. Um, so I'm a pharmacist by profession, but I'm actually embarrassed to be a pharmacist. And I said this in the last group, and I would suggest that anybody who's in a pharmaceutical company should also be embarrassed when we have an average of 50% failure rate. Uh, you know, I got a train down here from Manchester. If it arrives one hour late, I get a 100% refund from Virgin Care. That's what's called a contract. That's what's called outcomes-based travel. Um, 
I think that pharma and, for, and, and my profession have been too lazy because we've been paid by supply and not by outcomes. And I'd like to see all this value outcomes process stuff change that pharma get 40% perhaps for their initial investment, 30% when the patient takes the medicine, and 30% when you show the same clinical trial outcomes that was submitted in your data. That would definitely get them fixing the compliance problem, let's be honest. Um, in terms of what we call this, I'm a clinician as well, as I said, but I'm also a patient. And when I say to a clinician, you're non-adherent or you're non-compliant, I am passing responsibility and, quite frankly, the blame to them. It's no longer my problem. I've told you, I've given you a patient information leaflet, I've given you structured patient education. I can wander off because I have clinically done my bit. What a terrible term in terms of passing the buck. So I think we need to, I've talked to Keith Ridge in NHS England, even the term medicines optimization, wherever that came from, doesn't say what it is on the tin. And I think we need to go back to some basics. And if we dress up professional language and hide behind adherence, optimization, compliance, we're not gonna, we're gonna break things open. We need to talk simply about medicines taking. Keep it dead simple, that's <coughs> so, so let's stop all this professionalism and all these terms. I think we would, we would be one thing. Um, I think, um, there's, there's a key thing for me as well about, and it's been touched on already, but solutions that I've seen, and again, I'm no expert in them, but solutions that I've seen are often focused on communications and technology, and that's not what we're at. We're at relationships and psychology. And if we built the, basically an understanding, so, you know, I said in the other group, I forgot to take my medicines today because I was just well, unintelligent, uh, or just, you know, just forgetful. Um, and I, as somebody who has got a mobile phone, tweeting, but not doing my emails, I hasten to add, but I didn't even set in a reminder. And I've been taking these medicines for five years. Why don't I just simply set a reminder on my phone, I might even do it now, that says at 8.30 in the morning, at 8.30 at night, remember to take your meds. That, that's no huge, there's not, not a huge investment there. Secondly, and if you think I'm being controversial already, wait till you hear this one. Um, this childish attitude that we have that pharmaceutical companies are not allowed to communicate with the end user, hello? What is that about? I mean, that seems to be some sort of regulators getting in the way. Um, yes, it's a mediated project, product through doctors, but surely we can have adult direct-to-consumer communication. I'm not talking advertising, but surely the person who produces the product and who knows lots and stuff about it could have a conversation with one of the end users. I, I don't, I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but no wonder we call them Big Pharma, no wonder we don't trust them because they're not allowed to communicate. So there's, there's a really childish, a childish attitude from my point of view about not letting, you know, med dev can speak to people, you know, medical devices, medical technology can speak to consumers. Are they any more, less bad than Big Pharma? I don't know, Louise, later. Um, and then I think lastly, and I said this in the last panel, you know, I'm carrying about tablets loose in my pocket. I don't want to carry a blister pack, which I cut my fingers on at least once every three months. The whole process of medicines taking is a negative experience, and it's lovely to hear you guys talk about some of that. But, you know, if we think about consumerism, we think about interacting with our phones, coming to this hotel, if we began to look at medicines taking, none of these fancy names from a consumer perspective, and said, how do we make this neutral, even better, how do we make it positive, we might not have the compliance problem. Excellent, thank you so much. Well, this is going to be a good one. So, um, I am going to, I know that we're going to get dragged into uh, data, uh, monitoring and data, etc. I know that's where this is going. But before the carcass gets dragged into the cave, I want to stay on the topic of ease of use. Um, I particularly want to um, put the spotlight on um, John Paul and Louise um, because they've talked about this a lot and they're quite passionate about how product design can improve the user experience. And I want to really understand how end user feedback, i.e. patient feedback, gets into your design process um, and into the arguments that you would make for presumably some of your slightly more expensive innovations to be adopted. Hmm. Okay. So I'll make a start. Go ahead. So I guess this is, um, and just alluded to by Mark, I think within the device setting, developing <coughs> medical devices, there is much greater sort of usability, user experience, feedback as part of the design process. And I think what we're trying to introduce now is that into, um, into the development of our, our systems that we're now looking at in terms of these uh, smart and connected systems. So... Um, and that goes beyond, because I think when, when people talk about development of apps and they talk about software groups and going out and developing an app, 
that medical device piece is lost. And that's again why I think there's some, some real validity of bringing different, these different skills together um, when we talk about developing the, these types of systems. So what we're doing now is we're taking our medical device capability and we're pairing that up with some, some IT capability, we're adding in some behavioural science capability and consultation. And we're kind of in that mix, in that pot, bringing in patient insights, working with uh, patient groups, working with other groups and saying, well, okay, how do we develop this as a, through a, a device development approach to come up with something that's, that meets the objectives that, and the outcomes that we want it to. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think yeah, well, that in incorporates some very standard engineering activities. So you talk about failure modes, you talk about um, critical um, uh, use and, and um, uh, user experience. Uh, but, but the behavioral science piece is always adding in a perspective that says this is why, or this is something we can do. And um, <coughs> what, I mean at the moment, the kind of technology, what it allows us to do effectively gives us a, an opportunity to scale and do something broadly whilst bringing in all those different skills. But I think it's been said before, this is, adherence is really only uh, enabled by a relationship. And I don't think we're suggesting that we can replace um, that relationship, uh, sorry, we can replace a relationship with a digital tool, mm -hmm. but I think we can actually enable the building of relationships through these devices. So that's what I think where our real focus is, is saying, well, actually, we're passively capturing information, we're storing that, we're providing some behavioural inputs and insights, um, helping patients to support self-management, but enabling them to have a different conversation, a data-driven conversation with their their uh, HC, their healthcare professional. Yeah. Or their physician. a shaming conversation, actually. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> I mean, but, but, it, but it actually allows, allows a, a more, well, you can imagine the kind of current conversation, mm -hmm. that kind of annual checkup, which says, you know, how, which is rely, totally reliant on a patient's recall of what they've, they've done and how they've been feeling. Um, as opposed to a conversation that says, well, okay, actually, look, at the, look, look, this is what I've been doing. This mm -hmm. is how I've tracked symptoms. This is how I've tracked my medication usage. So it's a, lo a long way around, but effectively what we're trying to do is say we have a medical device with an intended use. We're going to apply some of that medical device development methodology, um, pull in you know, those kind of, uh, and through that, pull in user experience, usability, all those good things that say this is how we're going to deliver that outcome. And I think by pulling those different things together and, 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 and using those different disciplines and skills, that's, that's how we think we're going to actually do something different. I would say we're, um, do, we're working in a similar way, really. Um, it all starts with, you know, with the patient and understanding their issues. But, you know, that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. It sounds very easy. We'll just understand what the adherence issues are or we'll understand, you know, what the usage issues are. But they are so very complex because... Adherence is so multifactorial, really. You know, you've got dexterity issues, you've got psychological issues, you know, you've got behavioural issues, you've got lifestyle issues going on, um, you know, the motivation, the disease state itself, I think, you know, massively impacts um, the, you know, the, 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 the adherence, the, the issues that the patient is facing um, and, and the comorbidities as well. And, you know, in some of the areas that we're working in, um, COPD, you know, you've got an elderly population, you've got all sorts of comorbidities going on and, and you know, really trying to unpick the reasons for adherence and then, you know, how you can solve them is, you know, is, is a relatively mammoth task, really. And we're talking there about the patient and of course we have to look about uh, you know at the whole ecosystem as well you know in some of the work we've done we've determined really that the you know and this is my opinion given you know what i've seen that the clinician seems to pose the biggest barrier at the moment to these new technologies and mark made reference to it earlier you know you provide clinicians with data and suddenly the monkey's back on their shoulder um you know <laughs> How have I got time to do something with that data? When am I going to look at that? Do I have a you know a legal yeah. um, uh, exposure there by having some data and doing nothing with it? You know, mm -hmm. if then someone goes into exacerbation. So you know, and, and we haven't even mentioned the pay. <laughs> yeah, you know, how, how do we research what they want and and you know what what they're going to pay for? So. Um, I think, you know, from what I've heard JP talk about and from what I know we're doing, I think, you know, we're doing a lot of the right things to, to get to these answers and, and to try and drive up adherence in some of these more complex and certainly very expensive disease states. 
Um, but whilst we start with the patient, they aren't the whole story and there's lots of other things going on in the system. Thank you. I'm just going to widen the question a little bit and, and talk about new technology opportunities and how they relate to adherence and just quickly sort of get perspective to say Barco and Yuri and Mark on what you think they might be. Because it's, although a lot of this is about the devices that, you know, that you're talking about, the engineering opportunities there, but in fact there's a lot about tracking, mm -hmm. you know, even oral pharmaceuticals. So, Marco, what do you think the sort of opportun big opportunity areas might be here? Yeah, I agree with, with Mark when he said that it's not about the technology itself, uh, but at the same time, I mean, that's one of the tools that we should be leveraging because it's available and a lot of people use technology and particularly smartphones. So to the extent that we can leverage that channel to connect with patients, to engage with them um, and to drive behavioral change and collect data, I think we absolutely should. Um, and yes, there are issues about what we can do and, and how we can engage or rules on engagement with the patient and we need to obviously be very respectful of those. But I would like to touch upon uh, some of the other things that, uh, that you mentioned here about um, uh, about the role of the physician, and I think we're a bit all in denial. I mean, adherence seems to be a, it's always someone else's problem, right? So if you are, if you talk to physicians, they will never admit that their patients are not adherent because it, it, it's seen as a bit of a failure. Patients will not want to admit that they're not adherent because they may be judged and so on. So I think a bit of honesty and truthfulness, and I think of objectivity, and I think to that extent, data collection is good. Um, um, but then the question you know, quickly goes into, okay, what are we tracking? How are we measuring? Can we actually target certain outcomes? Do we have a good understanding of what outcomes are? And can we agree on what we're tracking and how? And, and I think that open up, uh, opens up a can of worms because mm -hmm. we're far from, uh, um, we're not close to, to, to defining what outcomes matter really to the patient and are they the same that matter to the physician or to the payer? So a lot more discussions need to happen uh, to align, let's say, our thinking on, on, on that. Yeah, I agree. A can of opportunities. <laughs> a can of opportunities, yes, exactly. Yeah, so, Yuri, there's some fabulous new technologies out there for doing Absolutely. very innovative things. So tell us a little bit. So technology is important. Uh, obviously, we do need to think about technology in the context of uh, what is the value for the patient. And that is important if we start by thinking about the patient first, and uh, whether this technology is easy to use, is this technology not gonna come in a conflict with their daily life? Is this something that uh, is gonna be consistent, reliable, secure? Uh, those are the kind of things that uh, we think about uh, on a daily basis. In terms of technology, it's also getting less expensive. So in the past, when uh, you would consider, let's say, adding a specific technology, let's say, to a drug delivery device, it always resulted in much more significant cost, the bomb. And uh, when you start looking at uh, what does that really mean in, ter in terms of profit and loss, there was always a point at which you would say, the cost of intervention is just too much. I can't afford it. And I think we're getting to a point where technology, whether it's a Bluetooth or the battery or various sensors that can go inside the device, they can be, number one, they can be miniaturized. So when you think about the device itself, you may not even have to modify the device itself. The device can stay the same. And you look for the real estate inside the device so that you can embed the sensors and all of the connectivity inside the existing device. And that makes it easier from a number of perspectives. It's the same device. Uh, from a regulatory perspective, it doesn't really modify anything that has been done before. Uh, in terms of submission to a regulatory agency, it may be much simpler. It may be more like an abbreviated application or an addendum. Uh, so those are the kind of things that are beginning to drive a lot of that innovation and a lot of the new sensors. Um, the kind of sensors that uh, we're beginning to look at uh, include a variety of things. Obviously, they include both uh, patient monitoring as well as uh, uh, the kind of sensors they can detect on whether a uh, patient has taken their medicine. And uh, where we actually see a lot of the investment is being able to do both, you know, at doing both at the same time. Um, a lot of the work uh, that uh, is taking place right now is around patches. Uh, to give you an example, we've done one study during the summer which focused on pediatric oncology. And the purpose of this patch was to monitor two things. Uh, uh, one was temperature, and it was continuous temperature monitoring. And in this particular case, 
the temperature uh, elevation was not caused by the disease itself, it was the, caused by the drug. And it was very important to be able to pick up at which point the temperature elevation uh, was taking place. And a lot of kids who are participating in that clinical trial, they can't tell the difference. Uh, you know, they don't see, there are no symptoms between 36.6 and 37, that it's, but it is a beginning and manifestation that something is going on. Measuring temperature in a child at night and sticking a thermometer at 3 o'clock in the morning is not exactly the most uh, convenient and certainly, uh, you know, being able to do this without disturbing the sleep is very important. The second uh, part of this patch was activity monitoring, which was an exploratory data point. So whereas one was a real data clinical endpoint, the other one is exploratory because what you're really trying to do is monitor fatigue. And fatigue, correlating fatigue to activity is not exactly very easy. But at the same time, it's, it is a very interesting endpoint because you, you can begin to see the progression of the disease. <coughs> Secondly, during this clinical trial, we also utilized a smart uh, blister pack. And in this particular case, you may say, well, you know, how do you really know if someone actually took the pill out of the blister pack and threw it down uh, in the toilet? That is true, but for the most part, we know that if someone is going to go through the trouble of taking the pill out of the blister pack, most likely they will take it. Thirdly, a lot of the new drugs which are entering the market or in phase three clinical trials, they're not necessarily a single pill. And when you look at the blister pack, you may have a position A1, B1, C1. Uh, pill A1 may need to be taken in the morning, whereas the pill B1 may be uh, taken in the evening. Now you can see how confusion for the patient. You know, it's difficult enough to take one drug at a time, but now you have a patient with you know, serious oncological illness which needs to manage multiple drugs at the same time. There is also patient monitoring that is taking place at the same time. And then you need to ensure that the patient is taking the right drug out of the right position. So that gives you a chance to really interact with the patient at that point. If something is wrong, you can provide educational materials right there because you're picking up that information instantaneously. So, you know, for me, I think as long as you're developing all of that technology and you think through the use cases of how they're going to help the patient, then it becomes really worthwhile. If you start thinking about it right away from the point of view, how am I going to get more money from the payer? Or am I going to be able to differentiate myself from another pharma company as a result? All of those things are important, but I think that uh, starting from from thinking about the patient and the value that it brings, especially around some of the pediatric stuff that we have done, it begins to make things uh, a lot easier uh, to implement and certainly much more worthwhile. I would actually like to just switch a little bit on the R&D process um, and on, in clinical trials and then the utility of data on usage in clinical trials, but also in the ability to get feedback, which may not be data points, from clinical trial subjects, mm -hmm. because that's the only opportunity we've got. If we're going to design a product, we've got that opportunity to get some feedback from those direct users directly into how easy it was for them to sort of adhere to the regimen that they were being given. So can we just talk a little bit about how we can use some of these new approaches to get that communication, because that is a good place for us? Um, and Marco, you're closest to me, so you can start. <laughs> yeah, I'm not ex an expert in, in, in clinical trials, but clearly the same principles that apply uh, in, in, more, in, in, in the real world, they apply also in a controlled setting of a clinical trial. So, I mean, a, a lot of patients that are in, enrolled in clinical trials are actually not adherent uh, to the extent that they should be, um, even if they're monitored. And, 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 and I think that is, I think, something that certainly can be addressed and should be addressed. Um, to the point about collecting data and informing further development, um, by, by all means, we should, we should do that. The question is, you know, again, what data can you pull uh, through, uh, through these technologies, and, and is it really meaningful, and are you, are you in time to embed it into clinical development? Mm, I mean, how quickly and how early can you, can you actually get that data uh, to really embed it in, 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 in the clinical development and, therefore, in the value proposition that you can offer at launch? Yeah, it might be. We're missing out on patients in the design stage. 
Which, yeah, in, I mean, in pharmaceuticals, you know, and, and in design devices, around. they seem to have got it sus, but in, in you know, pharma, maybe. No, I think there, are, uh, to my knowledge, and certainly I can speak about uh, Johnson and Johnson. We have in Janssen, and specifically, we have uh, launched a big initiative, uh, which is you know, company wide, uh, about how to engage patients early enough um, okay. in terms of designing trials and meaningful endpoints, but also in designing products, uh, you know, getting feedback on packaging, etc. So we are doing that. Uh, it's still, I would say, early days, and it's not as established as perhaps in the medical device industry, um, but I think we're definitely going in, down that path because yeah. we recognize that unless patients then use it um, and you know, they, they, they get what they want, um, we are going to all lose out. Okay, that's cool. I mean, John Paul, if you're able to track data during a trial, yeah. are you able to then go on and carry on tracking data when you've launched? So I think that's one of, that's a really interesting um, concept that we're, we're still just getting our head around starting to build, but it is that longitudinal data set. So it's not just um, tracking the data from clinical to, to, to commercial and real world, but actually it's findings within real world data that we can then feed back into our clinical trials. Mm. So it, I think we see there's value in actually joining it up and actually having that longitudinal data set. Um, so, and, 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 and you know, there's all sorts of organisational reasons and silos why that doesn't happen and you've kind of got to get to an enterprise approach if you're going to, to, to make that work. But you know, there's definite advantage there. I mean, just some of our kind of findings with respect to use on in, in clinical trials and in, into commercial and versus design. I mean, I think you've raised some really interesting points about just capturing better information back from, from clinical trials that go into the design. I mean, I think that's something to explore. I mean, what we've seen is, one... We, we believe that um, these types of technologies allow us to um, effectively get to, to, to existing endpoints more effectively. So you think about how can we design these in, be, be, deliver more effective clinical trials, um, making sure that we're kind of reaching uh, th th those endpoints. But then increasingly in the future, can we actually define new endpoints associated with these Can devices? you give us any examples of... So, in, in, I mean, I guess some of the thinking around the new endpoints is it's, activity is probably the earliest of those. Okay. Where actually you can say, if we can get to a really good position, this is a demonstration of you know, this, this medicine delivering this kind of activity. And if you can build a system that supports it, you, just, you start to move towards the idea of a combination product. Which what does is, an activity endpoint look like? Because I really like one, but I just... Well, no, and I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're struggling ourselves. What we're, we're trying to see is whether or not the current technologies are sufficient or whether or not you know, it's actually more of a questionnaire-based system, but it's automatically it's, um, um, populated with some of the information that a patient can record in the, in the real mm -hmm. time. So, yeah, I think we've... It, it could um, start to emerge. I think we've done some recent studies in right. that space. But just, for, go on. Maybe just for instance, I mean, patient reported outcomes, everybody is yeah. now talking about that. I mean, finally. Finally. Yeah. Uh, but how, where are we really? In, mm. in, are, we, are we seeing payers really uh, incentivizing or, or reimbursing for patient reported outcomes? Yes or no? I mean, if you look at the UK, probably only 10% outcome or less of all contracts. Is, is outcome based, and of that 10%, maybe 5% has some kind of incentives around you know, patient reported outcomes right. and quality and through the eyes of the patient. So I think there's a long way to go there. Yep. But these technologies and, and, and certainly can be a means to collect patient reported yes. outcomes. And yes. I think we need well, at least make it more mathematical because you know, that's what essentially payers, they're economists. And they, they need digital, you know, they need mathematical data. Yeah. And it's no good people saying this was marvellous because that doesn't really, unfortunately, cut any ice with them. I think Cer oh, sir, sorry. Uh, sorry. Certainly in the US, uh, we're beginning to see payers uh, willing to pay for the outcomes. And uh, one of the studies that I can point to, uh, United Healthcare in 2017, uh, in January, is starting what is called the United Motion Program. So members uh, who participate in high deductible plans will be given uh, a patch which will monitor the level of their activity. And as long as they fulfill the obligations of that plan, they will get $1,500 back per year into their uh, flexible spending account. Now think about this. This is just about activity and wellness program. What if we were to translate a program like that into, let's say, diabetes too, where you can monitor, glu do glucose monitoring, and also at the same time look at the compliance aspect of it, uh, whether someone has taken Genuvia or whether someone has utilized uh, uh, insulin pen. 
And when we have those discussions with United Healthcare, it's no longer $1,500. We're talking about a lot more money that could be, uh, be utilized to support uh, uh, the members of the plan. That's so. interesting. Mark, I have to, yes. Yeah, me. no, just uh, I'm doing some work in Manchester with a company called IntelliSant, and we have a product, HOWZ House, which essentially is um, put into vulnerable people's homes, looks at their electricity usage, matches that with uh, sensor data, which could be temperature, could be doors moving, and we begin to, after about three days of data, can look at their annual uh, their activities of daily living and then begin to predict potentially you retract infections, depression, et cetera, et cetera. So this is way beyond medicines now. Mm. And I think one of the things I'd like to take us back to when you talked about digital is digital's here and it's here to stay and I'm not saying we shouldn't use it. What I'm saying is that it should be applied in an appropriate and informed way and that really what we need to, rather than keep talking about technology, is we should begin to think about information as a therapy. Yeah. So we've already got information therapy. Every medicine that I've come across should have a patient information leaflet within it. Now we have a, ver a wide variety of quality, as you know, as, as we've seen. The MHRA, our regulated body in the UK, has, and I know they've stopped it, a pill of the month. So they actually put on their website a patient information leaflet that's been properly designed with patients and begins to educate them, rather than being a legislative document that gets across all the things you need to do, is actually potentially an education aid. Yes. Equally with packaging, again, the regulators, dare I say, with the best will in the world, get in the way and don't allow us to put websites or telephone helplines. Again, What's that about? If we're thinking consumer first and we've got evidence to support it, surely we'd be going to regulators and saying our design thinking, our consumer focus groups, whatever it may be, suggest this is how you need to change. Yeah. And our colleagues in the over-the-counter market here in the UK, the PGB, have been putting together a whole bunch of research that says, you know, at the moment the packaging does not elicit good consumer choice and good consumer behaviours because it's driven from a regulatory perspective, not from a consumer behaviour stuff. So again in pharma we're very good at thinking pharma and then we think that's consumer and that's medical device. Could we maybe join things up a bit? Oh, and yes. you know I, I at the moment interact with a large pharmaceutical company and I take a vaccine and I use a medical device and indeed I use one of their medicines. But I'm three distinct people. I'm not Mark Duman who has a particular condition. So I'm not interested in your organisational constraints and who, which shareholder reports to who and who's the chief executive officer. Treat me as a human being, you know, who has multiple diseases. But even, you know, just start with putting one disease all together. That would be really nice. That would be handy. Louise, you had a point to make, and then I'd like to just open yeah, up to I just wanted to build, actually, yes. on uh, what Mark just said, because that's exactly the way I see it going. You know, we're aware now that wearables are being developed. It's not just about Fitbits anymore. I'm forever being chased around Facebook by people trying to sell me all sorts of wearables. They obviously know I'm stressed because they keep trying to sell me this leaf <laughs> thing that you wear the, to monitor your heart beat and you know we're working in breathing monitor uh, monitoring there's handheld spirometry um, that's that's digitally connected um, so I think you know we we need to think about the ecosystem it isn't just about monitoring it's about how do you put how do you put lots of measurements digital measurements into the system that give you a holistic picture of that patient and then you use that to not only monitor them and, and kind of assess but then you can use that to make the interventions as well and I think just changing the mindset from we're monitoring and we're collecting data or we're collecting data to monitor to we're collecting data to monitor decide what to do and then make an intervention and turn the patient into you know a, a picture of wellness rather than sort of an issue is kind of the mindset that we need to have. Yeah fascinating I knew this is a big topic because it does it just opens up so many um, opportunities Marco. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to throw open the opportunity for the audience to ask some questions now. I don't know whether we've had anything uh, uh, submitted, but uh, otherwise... Oh, there's uh, quite a few folks if we can have the microphone. Do you want to go to that gentleman in the back there first? Thanks. I have two questions uh, to anybody on the panel, really. Uh, when you look at adherence, have any of you looked at uh, the different age groups? Um, yeah, for the pharma world, you know, we see the patient world as pediatrics or adults. But within adults, there's the elderly population defined as 65 and above. Is adherence a bigger problem in the elderly population uh, or not? Have, have any of you looked at that? The reason I'm asking is that in 2012, EMA published their strategy paper on geriatric population. And there was an interesting bit of data there. They showed about recruiting of uh, patients into clinical trials. 
uh, between these two patient age groups. So adults 18 to 65 and then 65 and above. So the ratio of uh, patients recruited from these two groups was exactly opposite mm -hmm. of disease prevalence in these two groups. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then if you look at some of the drugs that are on the market, uh, you take oncology for example, orals, some of those uh, uh, tablets or capsules are 10 millimeters to 14 millimeters long. And some of these patients will really all have to swallow that three or four times a day. So going back to Marco's uh, initial question, do we, the industry, have a role to play in adherence? I think absolutely yes. Uh, if we want to be patient-centric, we can't uh, ask that question anymore. We have to play a role. So design, I think, is a solution. So but have, have any of you looked at, um, at the two different patient groups and how to address geriatric populations? I'm, I'm going to point that directly at Louise, actually, to start off with, and then I'll ask John Paul to come in. But yeah. thank you. I'll just, and, I think there's a few other questions. And just one small comment on that is, uh, the difference between pediatric population and geriatric population, elderly population, is elderly population are not a patient subgroup or a minority. They are the main users of medicine, and industry often overlooks them. Uh, and, that's, and the second question I have is, uh, how do we address adherence to medicines that are off patent, that are in the generic space already? Because payers are reluctant to pay anything more for any innovation or technology that you want to bring in. That's a jolly good question. Okay, well, let's start off with the elderly population question. Folks who are in therapeutic areas where there are yes. big populations. I think yeah, two it's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, my, yeah, I don't necessarily have data on how adherence varies by the populations looking at, at respiratory disease. JP may have that, but I think um, my perspective would be that it's, it's, it's more complicated um, in the elderly and it just stands to reason you've got, you know, the comorbidities, you know, which is the obvious point. You've then got, I mean, I talk to payers in the US and you've got, um, you know, issues like um, elderly people, you know, they're obviously paying for their um, treatments and then, and so therefore they're trying to eke them out. So I'll take my inhaler or I'll use my patch you know, every other day instead of every day, and I'm, I'm sort of, you know, trying to eke that out. So I think um, it, in terms of differences in population, I think there's, there's just a lot more for us to grapple with when, you know, when, when we're looking at the elderly population would be my view, and we've got to be, you know, we've got to really understand that, we've got to um, be creative about that. Yeah, JP? Uh, yeah, so I think it's a, it's a good question. I, don't, I haven't seen any data that, that really splits it out in that way. I think all the reviews that we've done, you know, as people have said before, you, you basically fall into the being practical barriers. And I think you can imagine that there's, you know, more practical barriers in, yeah. in different patient populations, whether it's in you know, the size of pill or handling of devices and, and you know, uh, other conditions. So those practical barriers get in the way and, and, and are different. And, you know, the perceptual barriers, just as, mm -hmm. as, as you highlight, you know, whether it's kind of eking out that med medicine or whether it's, it's, it's just diff the different environments and, and a, a belief about, um, a bit about that particular medicine. So, the, I mean, the, the only way to kind of start to address any of those things is actually to target those interventions. Mm -hmm to target you know, solutions against those specific behaviours. We were sort of pushed, I mean, as we as an industry were pushed yeah. into paediatric development, mm -hmm. you know, through regulatory mechanisms being set up and regulatory expectations being created. So PEDCO came into existence. Lo and behold, we started doing trials in paediatric populations. So, or at least we had to develop evidence that showed that, you know, we could, you know, use uh, what we learned in paediatric populations. So, you know, I, I don't see any reason why that, that kind of, you know, Forcing our I mean, hands shouldn't yeah. come into being. I mean, there is, there is. I know there is some consideration, um, certainly in our, our product development groups, so more standard mm. approaches that goes what to target product profile, trying to understand mm. that. But I think, as you say, isn't there isn't a specific and special disposition. It's a difficult set of evidence yeah. to get, and I think therefore we almost need to be forced into doing it. That's that's all. Yeah. Mark, sorry, you have a very quickly. To make on this. John Wyman at King's College London has evidence around this, and I think one of the myths, if I remember a slide, says there is a myth to assume that age, gender, or ethnicity has an impact on compliance. Yeah, exactly. I, you think it's more or less anywhere. It, it, it's, it's a bit of a myth. Exactly. Um, exactly. So that's worth looking at. So, yeah. you know, yes, you know, there, there might be issues, but we need the evidence as opposed yeah. to anecdote. Yeah. I think the second thing is, again, a call to pharma. In the same way that you segment your customer, Correct. your prescriber audience, and spend lots and lots of money on laggards and prescribers and all the rest of it, could you perhaps begin to invest a small percentage thereof in doing the same with patient yeah. segmentation? Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So I think it answers your second question. It's not being done for the first segment, so I don't think we can really talk about genericising it because, you know, we've got to get it started somewhere. One, one more question, if we, if we may. Gentlemen, a second. Send here. Thanks. 
Thanks very much. Yeah, Bill Dawson, Barnett. Really, it's, it's a group question. Um, it's a group behaviour question. Certainly, NHS have now got groups of patients together for their own benefit to find out how patients feel, and they've been used, particularly in paediatrics, to discuss the work, how, how the, the young patients might feel about both devices and medicines. And I wondered if the panel used that facility within the NHS for the benefit of formulation. But the real issue is about patients, because I am a pharmacist, and when you work with patients at the cold phase, they like to be within a group that discusses things before they make decisions. So it's a, it's a group think effort, and the evidence that there is in pharmacy where groups of patients have got together to discuss their therapy, there's much better compliance. So the issue for me is do you, when you're looking at compliance, actually get into what's the behavioral route to get the patient to be interested, and how can we get to the group that they belong to rather than the group that we belong to? That's a very good point. That brings us back to the whole, we could have a whole psychology conversation, oh, yes. <laughs> which I'm not sure we have time. Does anyone have a quick point to make on that one? I would just respond that um, in the context of information as a therapy, one size does not fit all. And often when it's, when it's leaflets or whatever, we give children the same information. Uh, the Patient Information Forum produced a guide last year on how to communicate with children and young people and has about 50, 40 or 50 examples of how you can, uh, UCB did an epilepsy board game, uh, Sanofi have done a, a digital game for glucose that you get more points uh, when you put in your glucometer meetings, you, meter, you begin to go up levels in the game. So it goes back to exactly your point, let's talk about understanding the consumer and their behaviours and fit in with what they're doing as opposed to try and leverage our particular product or approach into their abnormal life. Thanks, Mark. Mark Mark has got one micro comment. I mean, to just make, to build on that, because I think traditional market research methods, I would move away from those uh, as well. I would go beyond that. I mean, ethnography, ethnography, I mean, just real life, user UX, UI. I mean, yeah. those are the new methods that we need to embrace as an industry as well to be very patient centric and understand what is really happening in the real world as opposed to in a Again, control, yep. you know, market research sector. Absolutely. John very, I mean, very quickly, I mean, I saw something that I hadn't even thought of, which was related to this market research piece, is, you know, looking at what people search on, on an, uh, can be incredibly powerful. You know, you look at the top five searches around asthma, uh, and, and they're, they're different things, you know, that you wouldn't even, you know, wouldn't think of. Yes, yes, there's inhaling use and these other things. So, immediately, just the way that we interact with the world has changed to the extent that there's data out there that we can absolutely access and already probably make... Yeah, smarter design, yeah, smarter design choices. Absolutely, it's, it's an exciting but slightly scary prospect. You read your time. One uh, we I'd like to go back to the previous question and just a uh, comment. What we see uh, in a population uh, from, let's say, 12 to 20, is a drop in compliance and adherence during the weekend, and we mm -hmm. kind of call it a drug holiday. And we see a significant drop off uh, from Friday to Sunday. And then in elderly population. Uh, uh, pain management seems to be over compliance where we have seen patients put four, five, six fentanyl patches and they are not aware of the fact that they have already put a patch on themselves. So patch detection of how many patches you have on is important. So this is something that, uh, uh, again, it's more anecdotal, but uh, this is the kind of information that we're getting uh, from pharma companies. Okay. Tina, you asked me about yeah. definitions. I'm just going to squeeze in one thing. I am 100% concordant with my statins, but 0% compliant, because my doctor cannot discuss with me the numbers required to treat. Okay. So when we begin to get into transparency, we need to begin to realize that the drugs we're making ain't as good as we think we are. So if we need to have those honest conversations and to enable ourselves and indeed our customers, both prescribers and patients, to have those transparent conversations. We need outcomes data, don't That's we? That's it. <laughs> Super. Listen, I'm going to wrap up very quickly. I've encroached into coffee time. Thank you so much, everybody. And what a great panel. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.